How long have you been doing that? Like a year, maybe. What happened that you got you went down that path? Was it just like you woke up one day and you said fuck no, it? No, I've like I well I've like yeah, hundred percent. You gotta part speak of it. into the mic too, but, my guy. Um, so I've been on TRT for like a year ish, but um, I just felt like shit all the time, no matter what. Um, didn't matter at all anything. I just felt like shit all the time, and uh, it was like pulling teeth to get my normal doctor um to get my numbers checked. Um, I'd like guilt her into even getting giving me a blood How test. The system works. It's so stupid. Like I, I, she's like, well, we don't normally check at like thirty. So she's like, you probably sh- don't need it. I go, I feel like shit all the fucking time. Can we please do this? I'm like paying you, and yeah. she goes, I guess we can. And then my number, my first set was three thirteen, at like twenty nine thirty years old. And she goes, well, you're in the normal range. And I go, if I'm eighty. Maybe like it's because yeah. on the spectrum, you know, it's like 300 to a thousand or whatever. And she, um, if it falls within the spectrum, they're like, a okay. Yeah. But regardless of symptoms, all the things. So, um, but she still said no. So I did the whole mom says, no, you go ask dad. I have a buddy who owns a line of test clinics. <laughs> so I just said, Hey, Alex, my numbers are 300. Can you guys help me? And he goes, yeah, come in. If they're actually 300, we're, we're good. And so I did, and I've been taking it ever since, and I feel so much better. So. Have you changed anything in your lifestyle? So I think this is the interesting conversation, mm-hmm. which is a lot of people use tests to mask all the other shit that they're not doing. What, have you changed anything lifestyle-wise? Is anything like... Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I eat better and I train better, like both of those. Um, yeah, I eat better and I train better. So I'm most consistent, like in the gym I've been in the last probably like five years. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently changed gyms. I go to a huge meathead gym now, and it's... The best oh, thing yeah, ever. dude, that's part of getting on TRT. That's a mandatory thing. Actually, what's funny is the, the gym I go to now is the only thing as close as I've seen when I was at the Lair. With, uh, mm. back, yeah, it's almost like a grungier Lair. Mm. The gym I go to it's now. It's like a beat up, like old that's equipment. What, I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. It's, it, don't get me wrong, though. It's not so beat up. It's like gross. It's like, like it's super clean. It's great. Um, like at the, the Lair. It's just worn a little right, bit. Right. Well, like at the, at the Lair, there's like artwork on the walls and every like all the equipment matches like it's you know that but this is um it's like twenty three thousand square feet they've got like four of everything and ifbu pro owns it he's like came in like fourth in the olympia and um it's bougie as fuck and every dude in there is geared out of his gourd and it is glorious <laughs> it's so geared good out of his gourd. yeah you go in there and everyone's just getting after it. like oh he's doing eight plates on each side of the hack squad i guess i need to step it up a little bit or whatever. Like you want to talk about how environment changes Dude. everything. Cause like that's, that's why I originally switched is because I just hated going to the gym. I hated training. I was never motivated and I just go, all right, I'm gonna, I need to get around some like motivated people. What gym were you going to before though? Like an anytime fitness. That's like, you can't be the bro, guy on test and at any time fitness. Up, yeah. man. <laughs> the world needs we, we, we gotta make one thing clear. You can't be on test and be at any time or fucking no. point of fitness. Well, so, it makes no sense. So here, here's the thing. I was going to this anytime because it was 60 seconds from my house. So I was going purely on convenience. I didn't care about anything else. Yeah. Well, I feel like that for that season of my life, I was like, that was what was needed because things were so busy. But then it got to the point where I hated going. I wasn't motivated. I literally dreaded it. Mm. And then the workouts, you know, are going to be trash. Um, did anything I was like, how much how quick can I get through this? Like that mentality. Um, and then so I go, you know what? I, I can't tell you the last time I've been motivated and enjoyed going to the gym. So I thought, what, what maybe I just need to get around people. Like who who do who do I know that loves training? Um, and again, I don't know back home I don't know like really many yeah. people. At least that's close enough. Mm-hmm. So I go, I just need to get around some killers. If you want you want if you're not motivated, get around motivated people. If you um want to make more money you get around wealthy people like whatever it is i go huh maybe i should do this for my own stuff and bro i've enjoyed quite literally every workout since like it was like a magic snap of the fingers and i enjoy every training session i get more out of them my wife goes with me now like i have met friends who are all ironically named jared at this place it's kind of weird Um, but yeah it's the coolest thing ever so What's like, what's your routine like now? Like, do you have a coach or are you? No, not currently. Um, There's, uh, I've actually been thinking about hiring um, a coach, but the problem is I don't know anyone off the top of my head for the thing that I'm looking for. Cause the problem that I have for the most is balancing this and jujitsu performance. Cause so, so the other piece is we might um, know a guy or two. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) We might know a guy too. Well, so I was actually, I don't know if he takes clients, taking clients. I was actually thinking about hitting up Dr. Mike Israel because it's Dr. Mike Israel and he's a brown belt in jujitsu. But, um, but, uh, yeah. So for me, um, I do have like my split that I do, but otherwise it's the hardest part I have right now is just 
the balancing of all of it. Cause I do jujitsu at least like four days a week. And all those are, are roles, not just like class time and, uh, four to, about three to four days normal in the gym. So, well, I mean, we've been talking about this in a few, in a few podcast episodes about how I feel that people will kind of transition from their first gym to a new gym, change their environment. People will transition from one style of training to introduce more to that and just have more layers to what they do. Uh, so that's cool. Well, dude, welcome to the podcast. That's right. Let's Very go. Very <laughs> informal intro. We're here. We're here with Jared Three Hamilton, host of Dieting from the Inside Out, baby. Let's go. I love this kind of conversation. It's the best, man. It's I love this kind of best. conversation because I, we, I mean, we, we believe that it's, it's, it's more than macros. It's more than just mm-hmm. training. It's more than that, right? So <clears throat> how did you get here? Obviously, you took a flight from Indianapolis to get here, right? But you being a coach, you being so passionate about helping people with the, the mental and emotional side to dieting and getting in the best shape of their lives, where did you start and how did you evolve to become a coach and want to help other people do this? So my whole journey was uh, an accident. Like every, every, every evolution of my stuff was an accident. Me becoming a coach was an accident. Me finding out the inner game is my favorite thing to teach on was an accident and everything like I stumbled upon and I go, Oh shit. And, but I was aware enough to know, okay, there's something here. And then I just pursued that, like whatever that next step was. So the short version is, um, grew up as a, as a homeschool kid. Like the, I was actually a really awkward homeschool kid. Like, like, you know, the old, the stereotype is like, they're scared of light and stuff like that. But, um, so I grew up a homeschool kid. So I really struggled with normal education stuff. Like as a whole, like when I went to college, I it took me like four years to get like an associate's degree at a community college. Like I really struggled, but then, uh, I thought I was going to become a physical therapist because my thought was, well, what can I do to make okay money? And I not hate my life completely. Like that was my only, like, you want to talk about having like the worst perspective on how to be successful. It's like, what can I tolerate the most for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life and make okay money. That was like my only filter. Not like, what can I do to be happy and thrive and be chasing my potential? Like nothing like that. It was, what can I survive the most with? So, um, so that's the route I went, found out one, I didn't want to become a physical therapist. Um, but I've always, always at the time was fascinated with like physiology and biomechanics and all that stuff. Then I found a bodybuilding gym. My first gym I ever went to was a bodybuilding style gym. But then when I was in school, they, um, I basically found out what personal training was, took a, as part of my, the curriculum, took like a personal trainer prep class, like NASM or whatever, um, fell in love with personal training. I was like, Oh, this is legit. And maybe I can help people before they need a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. So that's where like the bridge was originally crossed. But then I ended up pursuing the personal training thing because, um, my sole thing was, wait, I can schedule clients between classes, you know, so I don't have to get a normal job. Um, so that was pretty cool. Did that. And then, uh, I'd always had this entrepreneurial bone in me. Like when I was 12, I was like going door to door, shoveling driveways and shit. Like there's always been that part of me. So those two met and I started doing personal training, ended up getting like three jobs at different, like a, like a university gym, a giant YMCA and a mom and pop gym where I just built my own thing. Then I ended up building my entire in-person training business, um, quit all my other, other jobs. So I was just the, the, an independent contractor out of, out of a local mom and pop. So I did that for <clears throat> like five years, ended up doing like 200 sessions a month, uh, 438 and nine P life, like that grind. Um, would never go back and replace it. I learned so much, but, um, but then it got to the point where I was like, well, okay, I don't want to keep doing this in the, around that time online coaching. I heard this thing and it sounded cool. Um, hired my first mentor to teach me how to transition on uh, in-person online, did that worked with him for like four years. Then I started scaling my online coaching business and then more mentors and more things. And, um, and then now we're here, but then about four years ago, uh, ish right before it will pre COVID, um, is when I really had the big realization about, about the inner game stuff where like how big of a role the headspace psychology and neural pathways and all that stuff work in going forth towards a, like a physical goal, like transformation or whatever. And I felt like I'm a kid on Christmas morning and that's now where all my focus is. Mm, cool. So, I mean, for you, I think you're very big on what you stand for when it comes to the inner game and what you learned. So like what really made you go gung ho about that? Did something happen like personally for you mm-hmm. to really go down that path? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for the longest time I've always been into the, the headspace game as a whole. Um, like when I, like my first mentor got me reading books, like personal development style books. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was like, 
22 maybe is when I started like getting it into that world. So the mindset and the inner game uh, has always been fascinating to me, like um, how it applies to business and life and all that stuff. But I never correlated it to success in transformation, mm. right? You, you hear about guys like wanting to grow your business. So you need to get into personal development, leadership, um, all that stuff. But I never thought about applying it to teaching clients about losing weight and getting stronger and things like that. Well, um, so I'd always been into personal development as a whole, but then what happened was if you say uh, like what happened to me specifically, I, I actually had a journey because when I started going to therapy. So for me, I started my own, if you want to sound corny, my inner exploration of all this stuff. Right. So I started going to therapy just to do like a mental checkup, mm-hmm. so to speak. Like I wasn't like depressed or struggling really. I was just like, you know what? The more successful I become in life, the more I grow, the more things happen, the more stressful I'm going to become. I just want to make sure I'm doing things right in that neck of the woods. Like we see clients, they think they're losing weight the right way and they're doing like Octavia. So it's like, hey, we need to kind of like re go about this. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't doing that with my own headspace. So I started going to therapy, found out I was good about 90%. There's about 10% I wasn't. And I was like, oh, this could really become problematic. So that's when I dove really deep into inner work specifically around changing belief patterns, actual inner work like meditation and journaling and uh, emotional regulation and nervous system stuff and all of that. And I dove really headfirst into that. And then I'd been in therapy for like the last like three years or so. Um, and had all this stuff happen, like trans in, inner transformation stuff for me personally. Um, I started some of the guys in the personal development world that I'd like looked up to, to the most. Um, one thing led to another and I became friends with some of these guys, these heroes of mine and more work around this stuff. And then it just became so abundantly clear. This is what needs to happen for everyone. Cause when I said I found a, a lot of this stuff on an accident about, about three or four years ago, I was feeling really heavy about the business. Like the business was doing great coaching, love all of it. But then it was, it was hard because I'm like, well, I'm feeling heavy, like emotion, like when you feel emotionally heavy about yeah, something and I was like, okay, I don't know what to do. I don't, part of me doesn't want to coach anymore. I just feel like what I'm doing, I'm not in alignment with. It's like kind of airy fairy as that may sound. Um, so whenever I, I'm at this point, my very first mentor said, you just need to go get quiet. So I got an Airbnb out in the middle of a farm and I was, went on a little Jared sabbatical all by myself. Um, I do it now every quarter, by the way, to, as just Jared brain time. Um, some of the most clarity you'll ever get is taking a weekend by yourself and unplugging and just letting your thoughts breathe. It's, I think everyone should do it. Um, well, when I did that, I got a lot of clarity around, around why I do what I do and all this stuff. And I realized a pattern because, you know, so much of the power is in pattern recognition. It's what we do with, for clients. You're like, Hey, you're, you're doing it again. So for me, I noticed a pattern when clients would come to us, it was, it was like the sustainable weight loss guy. Like, Hey, here's how to eat donuts and lose weight or whatever. <clears throat> so, but I noticed a pattern where clients would come in, we just do our normal system with them. But I found, but I noticed, I never talked about this in like marketing or content or whatever. I was like, wait a second, Mrs. Jones is doing well, but wait, she has a horrible relationship with food. Okay, fuck. I got to fix that. Cause we all know if she has a horrible relationship with food, she's going to keep binge eating and she'll never get to where she wanted, she wants to be. So, all right, I need to fix that. Then I can get her to go to weight loss. Dope. Mrs. Jones is good. Then the next client would come in. She's doing well. Ah, fuck. She has identity issues. It's causing her to sabotage. Fuck. Okay, I got to fix her her identity, change that shit. Now I can get her on to weight loss. And this was like one person after the other. Almost every client we worked with had something deeper stopping them from the physical thing they wanted. And it was just like a, a foundational problem. Like the food relationships or an identity piece or sabotaging mechanisms or emotional stability or uh, a worthiness thing or whatever the case is. And it was on paper causing problems when it comes to fat loss. Like they weren't adhering, they were falling off, they couldn't be consistent. All these things that people go, what's wrong with me? I can't, every time I do well, something happens or I can't figure out why I'm binging on the weekends. Well, it's all this deeper shit that no one wants to look at. Mm -hmm. A mentor of mine doesn't even call it, he just calls it the unseenness. It's this deeper stuff that no one wants to look at because it's gross, it's intangible, but it is on paper the biggest thing stopping you from getting to where you want to be. So, um, mix that awareness of realizing that noticing the pattern and then me feeling like this is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. It just made sense. But then I immediately, immediately had imposter syndrome. Cause I'm like, wait, no one I know in the coaching space is doing this. I'm like everyone, like, this is like, am I even in my, my realm? Am I like legally allowed to do this stuff and all of that? So, um, but I went ahead and pushed through that anyway. And it's been the best thing ever for the business. Clients are the happiest they've ever been. Um, 
and then it's opened up doors as well. Like I'm getting on more, more podcasts and more speaking, more things ever because again, no one's talking about this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I love it. So <laughs> with someone's relationship with food, let's use that example that came up and like, let's say Miss Jones comes in and she has a horrible relationship with food and you know, every weekend that comes around, like she's binging and she can't get past it. No matter what she's trying, like she's just spinning her wheels and it's getting to the point where she's so discouraged. She doesn't want to show up to the gym anymore. Results aren't happening. Like, <clears throat> where do you start with someone like that? Because when someone asks you the question of like, what's the biggest reason people don't lose fat? Mm-hmm. Right? You probably go, well, it's probably deeper. There's something that's really going it's on. It's always deeper. Right? <laughs> so for someone like that, that really biggest tips for a relationship with food, because I think it's a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, I mean, that's that by itself, like that's the thing is the, if it's a big overarching thing, like the relationship with food. Um, I like to think of it as like, if I said vehicles, mm-hmm. well, vehicles is a pretty broad, so you got cars, trucks, SUVs, motorcycles, like you got a lot underneath there. So I feel like even with fixing your relationship with food as on the broad spectrum, like it still can be overwhelming for a lot of people. They're like, there's a lot of subsets to that. Like vehicles, it breaks down to cars, trucks, SUVs, all the things. Your relationship with food comes down to like your meanings that you associate with food, an emotional side, a label side, an action side, because it it gets really deep. But where I think a lot of people can simplify this is we need to have number one is is seeing what your um, the meanings you have around certain foods. But then not just that, but then the actual actions you have to be able to take, because I always talk about with inner work is really just two parts is new information and uncomfortable action. That's how I sum up inner work Mm -hmm. is if you're just new information, like case in point, like with your food relationships, I could, we all could sit here and tell everyone why no food is bad. Why no food is inherent. No, no food is inherently bad. Why we can all eat. No food's not bad either though. What's that? No food's not bad. No food's not bad either. Right. Um, but like why we, we're all going to have a great dinner tonight, but we're all not going to be worried about it messing with our results or the goals we have because we understand context, calories, portions, consistency, law of averages. We all get it. But for someone who's been scared shitless of food, the person who has avoided carbs their entire life, or they think if they eat 12,000 or 1,201 calories, they're going to store fat because 1,200 is their number or whatever the case is, or they've been going to Weight Watchers with mom since they were nine years old, whatever the case is. If you just say, here's the scientific reasons why food is not bad, why you can eat anything you want in moderation, why you should, yeah, have the majority of your calories coming from more natural whole foods, but like you can totally go on date night and not have to worry about it. Just don't eat like an asshole. Stop when you're full, get back on track as soon as you can. A lot of times people still don't understand because from the action, the action side, because um, it's almost, I, I view it like this. When we have your nervous system caught up in things um, because of these, these issues people have with whether food or whatever deeper issue we're talking about, um, it's almost like, you, like, almost like your nervous system doesn't care about the information. The way I like to explain it is if you're, um, if you're scared of heights, I can give you the pamphlet around why you shouldn't be but your nervous system gets a little bit, doesn't care about halfway up that ladder because the, the heights is the trigger. Well, we can't avoid the trigger and heal through it. So we can sit and tell people all day why food isn't bad. That's the new information part. Tell them, showing them and teaching them like nutritionally and scientifically why no food is bad, why you can eat all these things and have a very balanced life. But then the uncomfortable part the actions that go against the old conditioning as in, sorry, Mrs. Jones, but it's time to have the carbs or it's time to go through your first maintenance period because you've been in a deficit for the past year and a half right. or whatever. And it's like, Oh, Oh, I know you say it's not bad, but I'm still scared. That's the magic because there's a subconscious nervous system part of you that doesn't get it. And that's the problem. So when I'm teaching people how to fix their relationship with food, we have to change the meanings like, and really understand why no food is bad. Why, Um, context is the driver behind everything and all things like this. But then at the same time, we have to put it in the plan in a really strategic and simple way to slowly go the other way. If we've been avoiding certain foods, slowly incorporate those foods. If we've been scared to not be dieting, maybe we start in a hundred calorie surplus or, I mean, just not even a surplus. Like if you've been eating 1200 calories, 1300 is a fucking scary thing. I had a client one time, she was uh, scared shitless to not eat 1200 calories but she needed to eat 1200 calories and she wanted to lose fat and all the things. And we were going to take it nice and slow because she was so scared of eating more and fixing her relationship with food. So I said, all right, we're just going to go to 1300. Go, no big deal. 1213. She's freaking out. I go, you realize you're freaking out over like the equivalent of one of those little like dieter yogurt cups at Walmart, like, or like a granola bar. And she goes, Oh, (laughs) like when you put in perspective like that, she goes, Oh, I guess that's not, 
as scary. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm eating more. And I go, no, you're eating the equivalent of a granola bar. She goes, oh, okay. So we did that. And then your nervous system figures out like, oh, nothing bad's happening. And then it realizes, oh, okay. And then you're just one baby step at a time. And through, so through new information and uncomfortable action, we can heal the relationship with food. Mm, I love that. Um, I, I think something that stood out to me in, in that conversation is I feel that people become so behaviorally conditioned over a course of time, right? In time and repetition, one way, just conditions them to believe certain things, behave certain ways. So in order to change someone's behaviors, we've got to change their beliefs. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, does the work come first or does shifting the belief come first? Do you need to do the work and condition different work and different actions to shift the belief? Or do you work on the belief first? I think they're intertwined because I think belief isn't solidified till the actions are in congruence with it. Mm -hmm. So um, case in point, um, I like to talk about it in terms of like, we talk about identity a lot, right? Because your identity is what you subconsciously sabotage to. So we can say, this is the new belief. Well, this is who I am, the version of myself, or this is the new belief. But again, that's just the new information. That's just like me writing it on paper. Mm -hmm. But the nervous system is, the, is where it becomes problematic is when the actions are now going against the old conditioning. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about the body is arguably the, the unconscious mind, mm -hmm. right? So from a neuroscience standpoint, so the issue though is people can say, I believe this. It's when you hear people say, I know I shouldn't be scared to eat more than 1200 calories, but I just am. Well, they know like consciously the problem is our actions are caught up in the subconscious world. So I think beliefs and actions are tied together because I think before you can change your actions, you have to go, okay, what am I, if I'm doing this work, what am I going to believe? What, what am I shifting? You know what I mean? But then we have to have the action in congruence with those beliefs until we have a stack of irrefutable evidence that that belief is now doctrine. And then now things can really start to shape. And that's repetition through physical action. Mm -hmm. Cause you mentioned like the physical body. I'm, a, I'm like, <clears throat> I was, I was talking with a client about this. Um, I think a few weeks ago and he was just like, he honestly, he kind of lost it. And he was like, yeah, I just, I'm feeling like insecure and not confident myself. And I challenged him to go do something. And I said, go in the gym and you're a single guy, but go, go in the gym and just go around and give girls compliments unattached to nothing. Like, don't ask for their number, just like dope shoes, just like dope shorts, dope colors. And he went and did it for a week. And a couple of weeks later, this is, this is Isaac. He started posting mm. content and he started showing up because he wants to become a coach. He started using his voice through content just a couple of weeks later. He didn't say anything about it. I'm just sitting here and I'm like, he did it though. Mm -hmm. And then that's something that you have to do physically. And you, I mean, I remember my first time trying to give a girl a compliment and ask her a number. <laughs> like, the, like the feeling here in your chest you get so tight and so tense and so nervous, but after you do it over and over and over again. The other thing that's important too, and I, I think you kind of alluded to this, which is you have to learn to become unattached to the identity of the outcome. Mm. And I think that's the thing most people fuck up, which it's like, you go one of two ways, right? And like you use the word no, like they say, I know. And I tell him all the time, when someone says, I know, it's automatically ego. There's no way you're going to get me to believe yeah. That you know, so like, like the saying is, if you knew better, you'd do better, right? Mm -hmm. so like when a client starts, or if anybody starts saying, I know, or I don't know, I'm like, you're using your ego to protect yourself. That's all you're doing. So when you're talking about, okay, now we have to switch the behavior, the part that is the biggest challenge I found, and I'd love to hear your thought on this, which is, it's, you've gone one direction for so long. Now to go the other direction, part of it has to be letting go of this identity, but also being letting go of the identity of whatever you you perceive to believe about the next thing. Because if you become, and, and this is the, like you and I, we've, we've talked about this where it's like, there's no such thing as good or bad, right? So if I give you a set of actions and behaviors, you have to be able to contextualize that it is good, but it can also be bad. So therefore you do it to the point that it makes sense based on where you're going. Not just, oh, like I'm just going to eat this way to get to this point. It's like, I'm eating this way to get to this point. I also understand this may change. A lot of people I've seen personally is you give them a new direction, they ride it, and at some point it actually goes to the other extreme. So they were they swung from one extreme to the other because their new identity they became attached to. And when you learn, and I'd love your out outlook on this, how does one get immersed in the process and not get attached to the new identity? Because the, the troubling part is a lot of people will create a new identity, get attached to it, and actually create additional stories that don't actually serve them around that identity, and that creates the same problem again. Agreed. I would agree with that. Um, I think it's easy and this is a very unpopular opinion. I think people naturally go to the extremes because it's the easiest. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't everything. Like, yeah. like how it's easy to go. I'm not going to have any, like a, like a really simple analogy. It's easy to go. I will have no Oreos. 
I don't want to have to think about it. I don't want to have to practice self-discipline. I'm going to have zero Oreos because I can't control myself. But it's also easy to eat that whole motherfucker, like eat the entire pack. Mm -hmm. Because it can, it takes no thought process, no willpower, or no anything. But for a lot of people, having two Oreos and putting it back it takes the most amount of thought process, the most amount of self-control, the most amount of awareness, and it's most uncomfortable. So everyone avoids that. So even from this identity stuff, it's easy to either go full bore into the old identity or go too far with the new identity. Um, Your belief around the new identity correct. too, right? Because it's like, uh, and I think a lot of people, you've probably seen this with friends where it's like, oh, like I was a fuck up X, Y, and Z. I can never be like this person again. So now I have to do everything the successful person put their image of what that successful person is, does, looks like, will be, isn't really a complete image because they've never been there. So they start to create stories. So then they're like, they're an asshole. They're neglectful in other ways. So I think the thing that it is, uh, you elaborate on, okay, now you're creating a new identity. How do you create context for those people to understand that we're focusing on behaviors, not we're no longer focusing on what that identity means? So I think that's the tricky thing for most people. Sure. I think that's also uh, a thing that comes to mind during this conversation is uh, uh, a mentor of mine uses the, the term around this stuff is when we are changing and shifting on this like deeper level of especially like identity work, um, we can only measure what we'll lose. We aren't, we can't measure what we'll gain. Mm -hmm. And I think it's where a lot of people get into trouble because we're like, okay, I've been this version of myself forever and I'm trying to become this version because I get these things. This is the outcomes in my life that I get by being this version. But it's scary because the brain only cares about self-preservation. It would rather you be unhappy and sad and, and in a horrible situation because at least it knows you're not going to die. That's the, that's the battle where we're all in when we change our lives is because it's why people stay in shitty relationships, why people don't handle their money right, why they, their businesses stay small, why they stay overweight, why they struggle is because it's the old familiar, right? The, the mind and nervous system crave and drift to what is most familiar. So when we go, oh, this doesn't serve me anymore. I need to become this version over here. We can only measure what we're losing. Oh, my friends are, I'm not, I'm not going to be as close to those friends anymore. I'm not going to be as close to that life anymore. That the old familiar, I can, I'm going to lose it, but you cannot measure what you're going to gain over here, the life over here. You know what I mean? So I think that plays a role in it. Um, I'm not sure if that is like alluding to no, that. I, th I, think the, I think it's a good point is being able to show someone that less like the only thing you see is what you lose. And then on the other side of it, you do not see what you have the opportunity mm -hmm. to gain. Because that, that to you is not clear. The other uh, aspect of it, and I'd, I'd love to know, you've probably experienced where someone over indexes so much to the other side that they actually end up unhappy. Yeah. How do you how do you handle and work through that? Because I've seen people, and we've seen it too, people go from, I don't even know if I want to get in shape, to now I want to compete X, Y, and Z, yeah. and they look great, and then they have a whole identity crisis yeah. after they get off stage. So like, what's that look like when they over index to the other degree? Like, What does that conversation sound like? I think it's um, I think the biggest piece is awareness as as a whole. I think if we had to all agree like the number one. I don't know about you guys. And I'd love to hear your guys' perspectives. But the biggest asset we can have in this game is massive levels of self awareness. Because if if we don't, we can't we can't escape a jail. You don't know you're trapped in. Um, you we can't audit and change things until things are too late. So I think the biggest piece with that is awareness. Is oh when am I drifting too far the other way? Or when am I going back? When am I sabotaging? When am I whatever? Because if you're not aware, then we cannot course correct. And I think the issue is most people, this may sound like an airy-fairy answer, um, isn't present enough to know. Where most people are either addicted to the past, well, I've always been this way. Mm -hmm. I've always, that's who I am. I've, I grew up this way. Our family's been this way. Oh, I'm a binger. Well, that's because you used to binge a lot, so you're living in the past. Or we're living too much in the future. Like I'm all about having goals and saying, well, what do I want in life? Okay, who do I have to become to get that? And then painting the identity picture and all that and the plan. But too often we're too much into the future where we're not present at all. This is something I really struggled with in like the beginning stages of growing my business and doing what I'm doing now is like, I have a, a mental like space where I can't remember hardly anything from 23 to 27 because I was so in the future of the other extreme we're talking about of like, Oh, I got to become that. And da, 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 so da, that leads to a, a question that I like to ask everybody, which is, is it actually that you're too far future focused or you are so driven by what you don't want to be from your past that you think mm. that you're that's, because here's, that's here's, so good. Here's what, here's what I think people miss. And I, I, I say this and Chad knows this well. My path into like inner work and personal development was at 18. My cousin's a private pilot, right? So I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, who have you flown? He starts naming people. And I go, holy fuck. Like, I know those soccer players. I know that celebrity, all that stuff. And I was like, what about this and this? And he like, every answer he gave me, I think, I think I've told you this story. I was just like, you like seem so unimpressed by this. And I was like, are any of these people happy? And he's like, five. And I like felt all of my like inside just go, I'm 18. And I I'd look up to all these people and I'm looking at all the things that I feel like I struggled with from zero to 18. 
and I want to be somewhat like these people because in your head you're like celebrity, star, entertainer, athlete, whatever. They have this great life. And he was like, you'll find very quickly that most people are actually unhappy. And they, the reason is they don't live a life that's integrated. And they can't be integrated because they're not present. But they're living in the past. And a lot of people will identify it as, and I think you kind of said it, where it was like that four-year period for you where I didn't know. I, I was so focused on the future, but were you really just running from your past as aggressively as you could, identifying the thing you wanted because you no longer wanted to be that person? I would agree with that. Um, I think for me, it was, it, I think it may have started with that as like, oh, don't want anything to do with over here, full bore focus over here. So I think the intention may have been driven from avoidance of this version or this life. But then I can, for me, it was so much into the future. It wasn't even funny. You know, I think it's where, where, um, and everyone's different, where it's almost like, would you rather play to win or not to lose? Or are you driven more by avoidance of pain or pursuit of pleasure? Mm -hmm. Mine has always been more uh, avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in coaching as a whole, I don't know about, I know we have very different like client avatars, but in my world, I think it's 1000% avoidance of pain. You know what I mean? Um, I find that to be common yeah. for almost every avatar minus a very small set of, subset of people. And that subset of people, probably I would put in like the elite in terms of total integration. And I'm saying this because if I even go into like the athletic realm and I talk and I go look at, okay, I've seen people in the NBA, the NFL up close. The very few people who are much more pleasure focused at this point, one, have done some level of work to some degree. And then two their only vision of what they're doing is how do I give? I think Steph Curry is like the best example, which is like, they don't like, he doesn't talk, he doesn't like to lose, but the reason there's so much confidence and certainty is because it's putting work in towards continuing to evolve and get better and get better. That's the language he uses. And I think you'll notice that language in people who talk, which if you listen closely enough for a long enough period of time, you can tell, and I'm sure you've you've been able to see, you can tell the person who is actually completely caught in the past even though they try to tell you they're not like there are plenty of people who will be like yeah i'm doing this thing or that thing because of x y and z and it's like i I went from here to here and it's like you're still living there you're trying to convince yourself that you're not but and i and i think for like you said like our avatars might be different but to be honest and try to kind of chime in too i'm not sure that that many people are actually as linked to pleasure as they think they are i think there are people out there after they've done a certain amount of their own internal work that get there because there's a different perspective on life. But I, I think predominantly most people are, I don't want to be in pain anymore. I would agree with that. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. What do you think? So we, we were actually talking about this earlier. So <clears throat> I've when I look back at even the last four or five years, there's been so many decisions and there's been so many pursuits and journeys that I've been on, one of them being bodybuilding. Um, I actually decided to come off all, because I, I came off like my, highest doses of, of PEDs back in March, and I just came off TRT like four weeks ago. Wow. And deciding to just take a different outlook with my fitness that's like way more sustained. Um, and the way I look at it, it's like I could ride this way for 20 years. You know, when the way that I was riding for the last three was very charged, it was very like, I want to go pro. It's very like, I don't want to lose anymore. It's very much I want to win. Because throughout my life, like I've never been like a, a high level athlete in regards. I've been like decent. I became like a role player through high school. I got cut in high school, right? So for me, this was kind of like redemption. It's my chance at like winning. And I like rode that wave for like a while. And when I see a lot of people go to the extremes and do things like, you know, not that these things are bad, right? But they use them as, like, they can be great tools. But, you know, when we build reliances, like 75 hard prep, things like that, right? It's like, what are you actually running from? You're running back to a, a zone of comfort that's very temporary, And it's repeatable and it happens. But when you come down from that, where are you? Right. And I think that that's been a big lesson that I've taken away. And I hear a lot of people talk about, well, like I'm trying to escape the version of myself I was before. Like I'm trying to, you know, widen the gap or, you know, create distance between the the version of myself that I used to be. I never want to go back there. And I think that when you were talking about awareness earlier, and I was like, I was just sitting with this. I'm like, how does one discover awareness? brain dumps <laughs> like yeah. when you are with yourself and you're just in your brain right and like I love journaling um I love just brain dumps and, and journaling and this is where you know I kind of discover the beliefs or the stories that I have in my head and I get to look at those and I'm like hmm, is this true can I challenge this or not um but in in doing that kind of work you know I've been able to discover you know the place of intention or the purpose or the meaning or, or what I'm attaching to 
anything that I'm doing and be able to challenge that and work back and work back. So I think a lot of people are trying to escape a lot of things from the past, right? And I think a lot of my work recently has been how can I go back and nurture that version of myself? You know, 100%. How, like what, <laughs> yes. what, what would that version of myself need? And anytime I, I ask that to myself, I'm like, just a hug. What am, yeah. I, what am I gonna say? Yeah. Like, I don't think anything would really register if I go back, right? And the way I see it now is like these versions of me that I try to get away from are still with me every day. They still help me every day. And sometimes I hear the voices in their head, like you know this inner chatter, and I'm like, who's saying that? Was it 17 year old me saying that? 23 year old me saying that? Who's saying that? And how can I work with you? Mm. Right? How can I work with you? And kind of treat it like a coach client interaction in your own head. So that's the way I've been able to look at it now. I'm curious for that. You said 23 to 27. If it meant you were here today on this couch, would you go back through that again? I mean, no, I, I think I don't, I, I'm not a fan of like, of, of remorsing or regretting any of that. I mean, I know the fact that like if someone truly has no regrets, um, it, you I mean, you, you right up there with psychopath characteristics, uh, you know what I mean? But, um, so of course there's part of me that, that like, I wouldn't change anything because I think, you know, there's a, the level of life is always trying to happen for you, you know, sure. from a meaning side. So I wouldn't change anything. Um, but that doesn't mean I still don't have some like, ah, that's four years I wasn't present. Like in, in the, those like, especially from like a business standpoint, like the, the, the beginning grind days where like, mm -hmm. like, like to, to present day, I'm living the, the dream that I never thought I could accomplish from, from 20. Like if 20 year old Jared saw me now, I he would literally like not even believe it. You know, so, but I, so I miss a lot during that, mm -hmm. you know, because I was so running from that versus like that also is four years I could have been healing more. Cause like, even what you said is, um, it makes me, instead of running from that version, like what th run that's, with. yeah, well, yeah, not just run with, but just, just see, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, the more that I've done, like, especially dove into inner child work, cause we do, well, we actually have levels of inner child work for clients around this stuff. Cause most of our clients, like it's why I'll, I'll, I always say like the, the meaning of going to Weight Watchers with mom when you were nine, I hear that every day. Like stuff like that. Um, it, there's that version of like, if they're li those people are listening right now, that's that version of you needs addressed, needs held space for, you know, cause almost the way I like to view it to, cause a lot of times people still don't get like how serious this is, or they're like, yeah, I get it. But I just need to lose weight by like next vacation still, which we're talking on different levels now. But um, at the end of the day though, if you keep running from that, it's still going to chase you. It's like a dog. Like you run from a dog. It's a mirror, it, right? It's, it's like, yeah, you can't will, escape I it. I tell him all the time. I was like, the mirror will show up until you can see it differently or yeah. you can accept that it is part of you. And it doesn't mean you have to keep going through the same pattern over and over. Well, and here's the thing. When someone truly holds space and accepts, it will actually leave forever. Yeah. Like, 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 so for like, it's, it's crazy. I, um, like for, for example, one thing that we'll have clients do with these issues around this stuff, um, because the more that, to be honest, they try to lose weight because they don't feel the feel worthy or good enough because they've because they've always struggled since they were little. I go, well, wait, tell me about how old were you when that happened? They're like eleven. I go, okay, you trying to actually lose all this weight right now because of how shitty you felt when you were eleven is actually a denial to the inner child. You know, like I said, if you had an eleven, I said, is your daughter eleven? And they always are. And I go, I go oh, exactly. Okay, so if you had an overweight daughter who's eleven, would you? What would you tell her right now? And they're like. Oh, that she's good enough just the way she is. Da, da, da. I go, oh, so you wouldn't like be like, you're a fat fuck. Let's go to the gym. Because uh, because to, uh, to be honest, when when we feel these emotions around, especially the old version of ourselves, um, us fixing can actually be a denial of all of this. Um, we actually had a... Because yeah, we go and we also try to fix everybody. Yeah. So, so for example, um, like th there's a million examples we could give with this, but it's but too often fixing it is actually quite quite literally a denial of yeah, of of what it, it is Be, like if you like if you, i always think of it this way if you had a kid like if i had a son little jared and little jared just doesn't feel is like little jared's sad mm -hmm. me trying to show him why he should be happy mm -hmm. is actually a complete denial of how his emotions like no buddy you have all these toys you have this great life you know you have all these friends you should be happy like that's the shit that happened to me when i was a kid mm -hmm. you know like like, well, it's almost qualifying or disqualifying the emotion versus if that was my son now, I would go, buddy, it's okay to be sad. Daddy gets sad. Like, you, it's okay to be sad here. You're, you're welcome to be sad here. That's a whole different level of acceptance than going, oh, well, let me show you why you shouldn't be sad. Let me go get you more toys. Mm -hmm. Then the, 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 the sadness isn't seen. But too often in the world of transformation, because like you both said, we're running from this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we shouldn't go after these goals and become a better version of ourselves, but we cannot do it in the 
in the uh, in in the middle of it denying the version of ourselves Which and is these what emotions. Most people are actually doing right. Right. This is this is my biggest pet peeve, and I get a lot of hell online for this. Um, I am one hundred percent against the co- component or the or the, the idea that working out is therapy. Like when people, oh. like when people say working out is my therapy, I would agree. It can, it can be therapeutic. Totally agree. But nine times out of ten, the people that tell me they say, "Oh, working out's my therapy," they are using it as the biggest suppression and avoidance mechanism um, to not feel certain things. Hmm? You know what I mean? Because hmm. um, it goes along the lines of the same thing. The, the, the same things. Because it's given the great result. You got fit. Dope. But you fucking crushed everything inside of you. <laughs> so, yeah. I made one reel about that, and I got nineteen-year-old boys blowing me up. And I'm like, this makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yep, this makes all the sense. I won't be weak working out my therapy. Yeah, no, that would be that would be like if I said no, alcohol is my therapy. It makes me feel better. Yeah. Like, but people have issues with that, you know, of course, because it's problematic. But the problem is, too often people use a good thing. Thing, I'm sorry, a thing that creates good surface level results as a way to suppress emotions. I did this with my business in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Go go figure the the period of my life where where I don't remember shit is because I was I had this my thing was I had this feeling of unworthiness and not good enough and I had to earn I had to I qualified I had to earn X the, amount of dollars. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um because guess what some inner child shit from way back way back when I never never addressed. So for me I'm like, well I got to build this crazy business. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing was I did. But then the problem is I, I, and my business helps people, right? This but, goes to, I, I just want to interrupt yeah. and say this, this goes to exactly what I learned at 18, which is all these people who have a ton of money have, a lot of them have gotten to what you just said, which is like, I can make the thing, build the thing. I can pain myself all the way to, like a lot of my friends don't believe this, but I'm like, you can pain yourself to a hundred million dollars. You can 100%. pain yourself to billions of dollars. And I can tell you from even some firsthand experience, it will not change how you feel about you inside. I have, per, I have personal friends who make nine figures and I'm just like, one of you is like good, like fulfilled, mm-hmm. calm, settled. Others, like I poke fun at them, like, no. And I'm like, you seem like you're just like dysregulated. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, do you breathe through your nose or through your mouth? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, <laughs> no. And the best one is, I'm yeah. like, and I, I literally did a test. I was like, okay, when you wake up, is your mouth wet or dry? All of them minus one, the one that I figured was okay. Oh, I'm dry in the morning. I'm like, huh. So you're a mouth breather and you're <laughs> wondering and trying to explain to me. How settled you are. Yeah. You might just be neurotic to the point that you can maintain calm because that your natural state is dysregulated. Mm-hmm. But that is not the same as being calm simply to be calm. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's it's it's a very valuable lesson that you're kind of sharing yeah. where it's like, I went through what I went through. I got to where I thought I needed to realistically. And then you got there and you're like, okay, where did the last four years go? Yeah. It, well, it's, it's um, the idea that um, whatever emotion you're chasing is uh, not outside of you. And if you put it outside of you, when that thing leaves, it goes with it, right? Like a lot of people, put their ha- I'll be happy when I lose the weight. I'll be happy when I have the kids. You're giving the responsibility of your emotional experience to someone else. Right. Or something else. Right. Well, and the problem is when that thing goes away, like if I said when I, I'll be happy when I get the car, or I'm sorry, I'll be happy, okay, the case in point with the clients and that, that may be listening, I'll be happy when I lose the weight. Cool. What happens when you get pregnant? Happiness is gone now because now you can't have that body that you worked so hard for, right? Well, that's a big fucking issue. Or in business, I'll be happy when I may have this amount of money. Well, okay, what happens when you spend said amount of money? Or you go through an economic issue or a bad month. But I've and this was this has been really hard when I first learned this to get through my head is not having a gatekeeper on the thing that I want to feel. Mm-hmm. But then in reality, the experiencing the emotion first before the qualifier, if we want to call it that, it, then it allows you to achieve the thing easily, way or way more, way easier, I should say. Believe on the power to make or break you. Mm-hmm. That's a huge one. Like, I'll be happy when. And then you get there, and it's like, now what? That, like, achievement, it lasts It lasts for a very People aren't like, always time. saying that either. So, like, I, I'll listen to people, and you've probably heard this. In business, it's hilarious when I hear it. They're like, yeah, we're going to get to $100 million. And I'm like, and then what? Well, I haven't thought that far. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so the, that matters. No, we're just going to get there. And I'm like, then what? Why is that the number? And like, don't get me wrong, you and I and him probably have numbers and Jason and everybody. Like there's some number that you've like mathed to create some context for the future of your life. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. It's just when you ask why, they're just like, we're just getting there. And it's like, what does getting there mean? 
Mm-hmm. Why does that matter? What is the purpose? Are you feeding people like in America? Do you have some sort of plan or some sort of idea of what's next that you are actively developing for? It's just this arbitrary thing you put onto the ether. Like, I'm going to lose well, the we, we talked about this literally on the walk over here. Yeah. Like, uh, when we were talking about, like, just business bullshit, right? We were talking about, like, revenue targets. And I told you mine, and I said, and, and I said, to be honest, I lowered it. It used to be this because I just thought that's what it was supposed to be. And then guess what? I had all the anxiety around it because I'm like, holy fuck, how am I going to do that? But it used to be this absurd number because I just thought it's what I was supposed to, but I didn't have a reason. But then when I did the math, I'm like, oh, I actually only need this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it was, we had that conversation quite literally As we were uh, over, yeah. like, like fucking an hour ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I, I think the other side of it too is like that big scary thing that you aim for, there's actually nothing wrong with that. It's just the context in which you create that yep. metric, right? Like I say it and around him, actually when we met, we, we got on a Zoom call. We've told this story on the podcast before. But I was like, yeah, this business will do hundreds of millions of dollars and like we'll have a gym and all this. And he laughed at me off the call. And I could tell he was a little stressed. And I was like, I'm not saying it because I think that like a hundred million dollars is some fucking gatekeeping. It's just in my head being in the corporate world, I'm like, Man, like they just the pure fact that we get to play a game and that can be part of the process. Cool. Let's see if we can do it. And if we die and we did everything we could, great. Nothing wrong with the fact that we didn't get there. And if we do and we exceed it, also great. But we're here to play the game. Yeah. Play the that's game. the whole purpose. <clears throat> Enjoy the journey. Yeah. Well, and and that's that's been my big over the like the last um, year maybe that I r- had the big realization that I have not been enjoying the journey. Now we can apply it. Now mine wasn't necessarily in like fitnessy weight loss stuff we can be anything whatever the the goal of achievement is um but i had been suppressing in the in, the enjoyment of the journey and then gave a qualifier i'll i'll start enjoying it when i get over here to this point but the problem is then that that finish line always keeps me you realize you're a sick fuck and i i know i am and i i think it took him <laughs> three years to like accept it when it's bad and you laugh and smile through it, and you're like, "Yeah, I can't wait." There's been like, you know, <laughs> so, like when we met. That, this is how our dynamic works. Yeah. Uh, so like, anytime anything, whether it's business, personal, whatever, I start laughing and I'm smiling. I'm like, I love this. Like ups and downs, good, bad, or indifferent. I was like, oh, it's just the beginning. And when it's good, I'm like, it's great. And I was like, I'm just, I'm waiting for the next challenge, and like we'll laugh that one through. And that's when you, when you were talking about the presence thing earlier, that's what registered to me was that was a, a, a very early lesson of. Yo, if you really learn how to learn it when it's bad, you will appreciate it very differently when it's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, I will say, like, there's certain instances that even happened this week where, like, I, I literally did laugh out loud. And yeah. at some capacity, history tends to repeat itself and you face the problems. And the more you grow with anything, even in fitness, right? I like to use fitness as a great metaphor. It's like the more muscle you build, the harder it gets to continue building it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the you're just trading your problem subset. That's all you're doing. Exactly. So the more comfort that you have in facing problems and the more that you see that problems are your greatest gifts and not problems you know the more bliss and the more joy mm-hmm. and, and the more peace that comes with that um there's something that you alluded to earlier which i i thought was really impactful simply because of how simple it is you mentioned if the space is held it goes away and something that we've mentioned is that if there's anything that you're ashamed about about or you're guilty of or embarrassed about you just get to sit down and like just speak out loud about it. It holds nothing over you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that we enjoy so much about working with our people and working with our clients and hosting the events we do and getting to meet them in person. It's because, man, they begin to share things that they've never shared with anybody else, but they get to share with you. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to someone's journey of transformation, healing, whatever you want to call that, the more reps they put in of just expressing these pieces of themselves and loving that part of the process and being okay with that part of the process and be told, hey, it's fine. It's fine. There's nothing to be ashamed about, especially early on with clients where they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I missed, I missed the weekend. You know, I need tough love. That's that's been one that's come up for recently. I need tough love. I the need tough love. love thing. I want to like, <laughs> let me Are just tell you something. Oh way? my God. There's times I see it like, and <clears throat> I'm just going to air the grievances now. There's all these life coaches now, and they're all ex-fitness coaches. I'm sure you've noticed. Yes, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they'll sit there, and they'll post shit about, oh, like, it's tough love. Like, you need the tough love. I'm like, it's just love. It's not tough. Mm, love just so good. is. It just is. And, like, we, we were talking about presence before, and I'm like, you're not. These coaches, these spiritual embodiment life 
energetics coaches that are fucking feeding you shit into your ass. The, ch- the, the problem is, is you are creating constant identities around what everything is, which tells me you're not present. Right. So w- when we're having this conversation, the, the thing that comes to my mind is when does the story stop? When is it just this is what it is? It doesn't mean things can't have meaning. But like you said, it was like when things stopped having meaning, you could actually appreciate being in the moment. Like you could live here. It didn't have to mean something about the past. It didn't have to mean something about where you were going in the future. It just, this is what it, it is, is in this morning. Yeah. In this moment. And that's, that's something that I think I'd love your insight on it. Like what does it, what happened to you or what happens to someone when they get there? Like what typically seems to be the path that gets them to, okay, just be here now. What gets them to finally to the end point? Just actually be here. Just simply be here now. There's no end point. They're just in this moment, in this process as is. As corny as it sounds, I think it's just a level of pure acceptance. I don't think it's corny. I, I think I think it's a level of... I mean, it's corny to the spiritual coaches because you have to do your... The simple sure. things are often well, corny. Well, I, I, think it's, <laughs> I, think, I think it's a level of acceptance. Whenever I've had that, that moment where I'm like, okay, everything just is. Mm-hmm. and all the Because at the end of the day, I even know... Um, He's a mentor of mine who talks about this. He goes, you actually don't have an identity. Like we talk about all the identity workings. I've been saying and, that and he, for so and, long and, and, and people are like. And he even talks about how he goes, he goes, um, he goes, let's say uh, my identity is dad. I have a son. I'm, a, I'm dad. Well, your kid dies. Well, you're still here. So that wasn't you. Uh, my identity is I'm a husband. Okay. You got divorced. You're still here. What are you now? And. And, and well, and, and too often, and I, I want to I hear it because at the end of the day, too, is I think a lot of people get confused what they do versus who they are. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, can, I can go, like we were talking about cars earlier because you and I are both car guys, and I could go and sit in my garage right now and go vroom, 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 but that doesn't make me a Corvette. <laughs> I can literally go make the noises. I could, like, have some exhaust. I could literally go vroom, vroom, vroom. But that, Three-year-old believes that, though. Right, but it doesn't make me a car. I, right? I realized when I was 23, and this was from a, a very in-depth conversation that I think I still I have with my cousin at least two or three times a year because we're very into like doing the inner work, spirituality, all that kind of stuff. This whole life is this never-ending journey of realizing you're identityless. You have no identity. You just are here to live and learn. That is it. Because it's guaranteed you're going to die. Mm-hmm. So you just you just are. And when you realize that it's simply I just am, and that's the uh, entire space for what your life is, it, it life becomes pretty interesting. And I see usually when we, the conversation gets to this point, people go, okay, then what do I do then? <laughs> yeah, no. Right. That's the best. Here's the thing. You, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with like be, do, have, like the idea of yeah. be, do, have. They go right to what you said. What do I do? Yeah. Be. That's it. Exist. I think people get it also confused. They think, well, then if I just be, then I'm not going to, I'm going to just stay this fat piece of shit who doesn't accomplish anything. It's like, no, no, no. Now you actually have the, I think it's Dispenza, uh, one of my favorite, favorite people talks about this, where when you go into this realm of you are nothing, you just are. Now you actually, because you let go of all the labels, you let go of all the old identities. Mm -hmm. Now you can actually be whatever you want. There's like now unlimited possibilities. Once you have the acceptance of, I am purely this moment. I'm purely just the, na- I'm just, I'm the only thing that we are this moment in love. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> that's it, you mm-hmm. know? But once we accept that, then now we can go do shit if we want to, but, but as long You're as it's also talking from the standpoint of you're immersed in the beauty of the process sure. and the moment. Right. Sure. So like every, many people listening, this is how they see fat loss. Once the pooch is off, I look great in my suit. Yeah. That's what they see. hundred percent. Versus like, and he knows this because we, we, we were training with Jason for the first time a few years back. And it was me, Jason, and Chad. And I, you, you remember this. We, we went to do dumbbell presses. And this is how much I love training. I just, every session, I'm like, how do I get better? Little technical. Like, in a set, I'm very present. I didn't even realize what they were saying. But I went and I picked up the weights and I picked up the 120s. And we were, he was, Jason was talking to me. So I was like talking and I didn't realize I was doing it. And then I got up and then Chad goes, you see this kid? Just fucking picks up the weights and he's talking to us like that. It's okay. But it's like that in that moment, it like was a reminder of you've been so immersed in this, this process in every moment for so long. Mm. It didn't even register to you that what you're doing to many people seems extraordinary. To me, it was like, oh, it's just a set. We're warming up. This was no, like seriously. Warms up with no, no, it's, <laughs> this I understand. No, no, and that's exactly under- what comes out of my mouth every yeah. time I train with him. No. I go, this motherfucker. 
that's what again for me though it's one of those things where it's like i've been immersed in that process that even 10 years later it's like i just love this and it's cool and it's fun it's like okay now i can do this cool thing where i can lift and talk that's how i saw it yeah. it didn't register to me that he jason was gonna stand there and be like really what the fuck are you doing <laughs> like he was like i'm he literally goes i'll do the 60s so what you're saying is we're not going to train while I'm here. <laughs> no, 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 we can train. We can no. train. There's nothing wrong with no, okay, training. Okay, Chad and I will go train. You can go to somewhere else. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. But, and again, it's just like, it, and that lesson, it was one of the very helpful ones that I got. And I, I don't think most people learn this their whole lives, to be honest with you. Yeah. Which is like, just enjoy the moment and appreciate it. Because after 10 years, if you've just been immersed in the process, and you, you know this well, 10 years of being immersed into this, it's like, there are just things that come natural to me. I'll train with someone and they're like, why do you know that? Why do you see that? Why do you experience yeah. that? And it's like, I've just been enjoying the game. I've been having fun. Same thing in business. Like I can see, have a conversation with someone and be like, ah, oh, this is your problem. Like, how do you know that? I'm like, pattern recognition. We've been sure. doing it for a while. I, I'm here with you in this moment. And I also have this repertoire of experience that I can pull from and say, okay, this might be this, this might be this, this might be this. I, it, 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 to my to my experience, it makes life really fun. Well, I've, there's two things that I think with that, where because it's one of the corny like the, the corny fit things that that you hear that's overused. Are you using the word corny because you're from Indiana? Is that why? Like, just, I'm from Nebraska, wait, so I should be. Using wait, the do word no corny. does no one else outside of like the Midwest say corny? Dude, no, really corny old. is a figure of speech that only certain people. Wow, I, I didn't swear, know it's that. Like, it's like I mostly mean, Midwest people. Like corny, the, corny lives in my. Yeah, in my repertoire. Okay. Jason's from Illinois, and he—I've heard him use "corny" a little bit too much. Do you guys use though. the term "horse shit"? Yes. Like, oh, that's horse shit. Yes. No, it's not. Like, <laughs> well, no, 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 I've transitioned not, more to dog shit. The, dog the shit. other thing too is I it's not like it's not used in other places, okay. but when it's just heavily emphasized and you're using the same two things, I'm like, he's definitely. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, uh, it's, it's across my forehead. Yeah. But one of the things that is very corny that you hear overused that's one of the things that is really really true is this concept of enjoying the journey and being present so you can enjoy all Absolutely. of it but the thing is though i think don't most people don't realize the utility of enjoying the enjoying the process yeah. of this because a that's where you're going to spend m most, most of your time. time every single bit like you're going to be building this transformation or building the muscle or trying to accomplish the thing that's where you're going to spend years in the in the trenches, yep. so a so there's the a util the first utility, and then the second is you're gonna have to keep doing the same shit once you get there. So if you don't enjoy the journey, you're not gonna enjoy the destination. A good friend of mine, his the best analogy on this I've ever heard is he said, "All right, have you?" He said, "Jared, have you ever gone on like date night, but you and your wife like argued the whole way there, and it's usually over like where you're gonna get food at." And ever we've all done that. We've all had an argument on the way to dinner with our significant other, and he goes did you just snap out of it when you get there? I go, well, no. And he goes, right. You just kind of wish you didn't go. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of accurate. And he goes, it's no different here. If you, if our people, cause he's another coach, he goes, if our people hate the journey mm -hmm. and they don't enjoy it, you don't just snap out of it. Once you get there, you're going to go, wow, I was happier when I was fat or, you know, or we're going to sabotage it and all mm -hmm. the things. Mm -hmm. But the utility of enjoying the journey is Prof almost profound. It's where you spend the majority of your time. And then once you get there, you're gonna have to keep doing the same shit. I actually had this realization in a totally different area. Uh, it was in jujitsu. So my major one, for those that don't know, my other major passion is I love grappling. I love jujitsu. Uh, I'm currently uh, on th almost done with my, my blue belt, but I wanted, when I got my blue belt, it was great. Like it's the first, like you're officially an upper yeah. rank, all the things. It was dope for about 30 minutes. And I go, well, back to getting squished like you know that was it I, I was like because you know trained I got all trained took like three years to get it and I'm like dope and then it was my time and then I'm like all right Jared and I go oh holy shit felt great everyone's high-fiving hugging and all the things getting pictures and then after those half hours all right let's go train and it was back and I was getting squished and uh I just have a bigger target on my back now but it was dope for 30 minutes and it's back to normal training so like if we delay our happiness until we get the belt or get the 30 pounds off we get the money we get the car you have the kids it's dope for 30 minutes and then you're back to where you were so if you can't have the happiness before all that you're not going to have it after this is where you can tell someone either lives in their childlike nature or they don't which is like how much do you dwell in the identity of happiness being around something that you've quote unquote waited so long for yeah right it's like you said 30 you get the car 30 minutes later it's like life is the same mm -hmm. completely and at what point does achieving something be a means of comfort to escape the reality yeah. of what is just day to day? It's it, you have to think about it too, though. Like everybody who wants to wear their achievements out, 
and I think this is the problem in the whole online space, which is everybody wants to put in their bio, CEO, seven-figure business owner, X, Y, and Z, because they think they're Gary Vee, mm. and they think it means something. And I, most people, I, I personally, I don't know about you, I look at it, and I'm like, cool. We gotta, <laughs> the bio's got to be like this I, entire identity so that every, yeah. you want to make sure everybody reads this and knows exactly who you are. Because mm. if they see something, you are confident that they will perceive you and will overlook anything else that is true about you yeah including the things that you want to overlook about you because you don't like them yeah my favorite is when they're like 80k on tiktok <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, yo it's it is wild to see oh 2.1 million on tiktok yeah but what did i see the other day oh my i don't even know the name of the social app but it was like 23,000 on, and I read it, and I go, what is this? And I clicked on it, and I was like, this is another app. It's like I've on Clapper never... or something. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who the fuck even cares that you have 23? You, it would, you know what we should do? We should just do the, new, do the nostalgia game where it's like, yo, the first guy with 10K on Instagram. Oh, yeah. I think that would be hilarious. Yeah. Like, hit that 10K was, in June of 2020. Was the that was the fucking change. Yeah. yeah. I think in uh, Cards Against Humanity, there's one of the, the the questions like who goes first is who has the largest TikTok or Instagram following. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. But that's funny. One question for you. One question for you to really wrap this sucker up here. And I think you're going to love it. I think you're really going to love it. Why is someone's transformation journey or even why has your transformation journey? Answer it any way you would like to or combine the two. That's, that's good too. I think you're a, com- I think you're a combined the answer okay. kind of guy. <laughs> Tran- how is transformation more than just physical? For you, for others, for everyone listening today. Why is transformation more than just physical? Mm-hmm. That's such a good question, but I also feel like it's a loaded question. Oh yeah, it's loaded. It's meant to be. Give us, give us your spiritual two sentence beautiful pr- presentation oh, great now you're making me like only two sentences fuck there's a reason i have a podcast is because nah, i like dude, to talk you can you can you can answer this Tell any way you want, you want. I, I i mean i it's because we're more than just physical beings mm-hmm. at the end of the day like it's why it's more than just physical is because we are more than just physical mm-hmm. you know what i mean we're not just robots of just skin and muscles you know what i mean we have desires we have the whole thing we've been talking about like most of us are running from this version of ourselves that we haven't yet held space for or seen so it's in most people's pursuit of some sort of happiness because we're a spiritual creature so i think that's why i think the physical is where most people enter is the only spot where most people enter the realm of a development of some sort most people aren't willing to sit down and do inner child work in like the amount of people who's willing to do a keto diet over like meditate for five minutes is bewildering to me. But most people are the only way they're going to find some level of development and growth as a person is through something physical. Mm -hmm. And it's bewildering. It's just another identity they get to wear. It's not that bewildering. I think it's crazy, but that's you have to understand though. There's only like 20% of people on earth that are this way. Maybe he's making my head pretty big right now. (laughs) I'm just, it's just being honest. Like, if sure. we're using Pareto's principle, we could break this all the way that's, down. That's and valid. It's easy to find. That's valid. But no, I think that's it. I think it's because it's it's, we are more than just physical. Mm-hmm. I, think most, I think most people don't want to it, agree with that. Mm-hmm. But then there's this side of them that wants more. You know what I mean? So. And for you, specifically, when you look at your journey and your transformation journey, who you've been able to become today, right? A lot, of, a lot of people that are maybe listening or maybe tune in to your podcast are so focused on the result of the 20 pounds being lost or you know how much they need to be training or how less they need to be eating or how much more training they need to be doing, right? So for you, when you look back, what has your transformation journey really, really meant to you? How has it helped you become this individual today? <laughs> I mean, I think for me, it's just been, it's been... Oh, in its simplest form is a way to pursue whatever we want to label the potential is Mm -hmm. right. Which is still a never ending thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but number two is, uh, being able to connect deeper with who, with, with myself Mm -hmm. and who I am and grow through it. Cause I, I, cause I still think at the end of the day, like, yes, we need to all be present in, in the moment, but I think, I still think we are all growing or dying Mm -hmm. and we're moving forward or moving backwards. Nothing sits still. So for me, um, internal and external, it's a level of a, pursuing my potential B, uh, building the relationship I have with myself cool. and then C, um, growing as a whole. That's why I have this whole sleeve is all about grow or die. It's the same, it's the same concept. So I love it. 
Well, dude, thank you so much. Where can everybody find you? Well, thank you, boys. I appreciate it. This has been a blast. I love kind of, I love seeing both of you. We could go for three more hours. We totally could go for three we'll more do hours. Another episode for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I want to turn around and I have some questions I want to ask you boys on my show, which is dieting from the inside out on all platforms. Let's go, baby. <laughs> YouTube, Spotify, Apple. Everything. Dieting from the inside out. I hang out on Instagram if you want short form content. Real Jared Hamilton. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs>